Welcome to the Shipping Podcast, where you meet interesting maritime professionals sharing their passion for the shipping industry and their everyday job. I am your host. My name is Lena Gottberg. Welcome to the 48th episode of the Shipping Podcast. This is the Swedish Shipping Profile of the Year 2016 speaking. I have been awarded. I'm so happy. Because the work that I have been doing has been noticed by others. And the justification from the jury was that I have contributed greatly to spread knowledge about and increase interest in shipping through communication in an innovative way via social media. Well, you knew, didn't you? Because you are listening to the podcast and that is a way of digital communication. But I'm so happy. It's such a boost to be acknowledged by your peers and by people that actually realize what I'm trying to do. Besides being honored and happy, all of a sudden I find myself in an exclusive group of ship owners, port CEOs, inventors and other contributors to the shipping industry in Sweden. The association handing out the award was founded in 1944 during the Second World War when ships in ladder traffic made trade to and from Sweden possible. However, it wasn't very smart to publish the whereabouts of these ships. So an informal forum where shipping people and journalists could meet was established. And that is the association that is handing out the shipping profile of the year every year in Sweden. But back to the shipping podcast. In this episode, you are going to meet Remy Eriksson, who is the group CEO of DMVGL. It's an exciting episode. We're talking about technique and digital and all the other stuff that I am so interested in. I want to mention a few words about the venue where we met. We met in Visby in Gotland. Gotland is the largest island in the Baltic Sea. It's not very big, but it's the largest island. From north to south, it's 170 kilometers and it's 50 kilometers wide. It got about 57,000 inhabitants. But once a year, politicians and lobbyists meet for the Almedalen week, which is the first week of July. Almedalen started in 1968 when the leader of the Socialist Party, Olof Palme, spoke from the back of a lorry in Visby. And that is almost 50 years ago. Nowadays, it's like a big fair, outdoor, more or less with about 40,000 participants. It's free to attend, and it's a field day or a field week for politicians and lobbyists. Every parliamentary party has one day each in this week, according to a rolling timetable. I have enjoyed being at Almedalen for five years now. There is a maritime meeting place where we invite politicians and lobbyists to see and understand what shipping is all about. And it's also a lot of free things you can go and see and visit. It's so many seminars. I think it's more than 4,000 seminars to visit within a week. There is nothing you can't learn when you visit Gotland the first week of July. It was Remy Eriksson's first visit to Almedalen. And I think he enjoyed himself very much, at least from what I could see. Without further ado, this is the interview with Remy Eriksson. Please enjoy. Welcome to the Shipping Podcast. Thank you. Could you please introduce yourself? My name is uh, Remy Eriksson. I'm the Group President and CEO of DMVGL. Welcome to Sweden. We are in Almedalen. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. So, what is your background? How did you end up as head of DMVGL? Well, I'm... I graduated as uh, you know a master of science within electronics and computer science, and uh, had some internships at Ericsson, the Swedish telecom company, and uh, at the southern part of Norway at the time. And then I was applying for a job in DNV at the time, and um, and I found it very exciting and, and started immediately after finishing school and been working there for 23 years now, or soon 24 actually. Oh, I see. So that must be a company that you really enjoy working for them. Well, it's an international company. So, of course, when you work in such a company, you will have opportunities to work uh, 
within different disciplines, within different industries and in different countries. And I've used that opportunity. So you constantly get a learning experience and, and your curiosity can be satisfied, uh, you know, in, in different uh, locations and in different industries. So it's been a very great journey. For people who doesn't know, what is a classification society? Well, the classification society is, is a concept that uh, is uh, quite old and um, it is a, a third party, uh, you can call it, uh, where you are part of between a ship owner and the yard and um, the designer. So typically you have a designer that designs the ship or you can have a design capability within the yards and then the owner orders a ship from the yard and uh, then you act as a third party, meaning you are reviewing the design. You review all aspects related to, to the ship and then you follow up during construction to make sure that the ship is built according to the specifications. And then you also follow up with, uh, you know, during the operations of the ship into the lifetime of the ship. So in the beginning, uh, when the ship is constructed, uh, it's the contract is between the class society and, and the yard. When the ship goes into operation, the contract kind of changes and, uh, and uh, the contract is then between the class society and, and the ship owner. So uh, in order to have insurance, you need to have class. So that's where the classification comes from. So it's a second pair of eyes, making sure that uh, uh, everything goes according to international standards and the class rules of the classification society. So each classification society has their own rules that this design has to satisfy and, and that you also follow the, up through construction and into operations. So that's how it started for us 152 years ago. Uh, but of course, since then, we have kind of developed this uh, and part of this concept of classification is then in, you know, adopted by other industries like the oil and gas industries. So for rigs, for instance, offshore supply vessels and also kind of a similar way of verification schemes is adopted by the oil and gas industry. And we have since also developed into renewables, into power distribution and transmission systems, and also into healthcare and life sciences. So we are kind of mainly a classification society, but we also provide service to other industries. So where did you start out in the company when you started <clears throat> first? I started first in, in the oil and gas industry. So working with uh, risk assessment and reliability analysis, and then a lot of my time in the beginning was spent in gas distribution systems to look at uh, how gas could be reliably uh, distributed in the North Sea to the European uh, continent and then worked uh, later with, uh, with deep water technologies in Houston. So I worked uh, in, in Houston, in Texas for a few years, uh, worked with deep water assets and, and rigs and then later on in, into shipping and also a couple of years within renewables uh, before I, I moved to Singapore and uh, was responsible at that time, DNV, Norske Veritas, uh, operations in, in, in the Far East. And then we merged with GL in the September 2003 and I became the CEO of uh, the, the group and, um, and was responsible for all the integration activities uh, until I then became the CEO uh, of the company uh, in August last year. An exciting trip, so to say, more or less. Yeah, it's been very exciting. And, you know, never been a boring day. You know, always, uh, you know, new things to learn and, uh, uh, you know, different types of customers. And, of course, uh, the industries are, are all different. But I think now we are seeing that a lot of things we are doing in one industry can be deployed in, in other industries. So... So uh, that, I think, means that we are quite diversified as a company. 70% of what we do is within maritime and oil and gas, and then 30% within energy and what we call business assurance, which is ISO 9000 certification and also life sciences. But we see that a lot of the things now is going on is related to battery hybrid systems and also digitalization is kind of a common denominator uh, that we see is kind of bringing different 
Previously, different segments uh, and industries and sectors are now becoming closer because of this digitalization thing. Hmm. How do the clients, the ship owners, see that? Uh, you must see a variety of ship owners in their process of becoming more and more digitalized. Yeah. No, they use. Uh, they see this as an opportunity to become more efficient. I think uh, also a lot of them see it as an opportunity to um, to actually be able to operate even more safe than what we do today, because you can have systems um, that can support you from shores. You have expertise at your service, basically uh, on, on board the ships, and you can have. Uh, all kinds of remote assistance uh, now, and you can also stretch it and to have fully unmanned ships, uh, you know, autonomous ships, and I think that will come. In the beginning, it will probably be in inland waterways and, and coastal shipping. We will probably see some applications very soon on that, but on deep sea, there is no regulatory kind of framework to, to be able to manage uh, unmanned ships and autonomous ships. But I think you can also take advantage of some of these to have collision avoidance systems. You can have early uh, alert systems, which can help you. And you can also force the captain to stay within certain uh, sectors and to be able to deviate from those uh, sectors. You, you have to get permission or you have to have good arguments. So you can see that you can have <coughs> uh, some awareness uh, systems, which will make the whole uh, voyage more safe and uh, avoid human error, which is one of the main drivers for unsafe situations mm. in shipping. Do you also see new kinds of material in ships and things like that? Which is... We have see composites, actually, and uh, <clears throat> we think that's uh, it's a great opportunity to kind of make uh, the ship lighter. We see that on, uh, on hatch covers, on bulkers. We are doing some pilot studies now and some pilot work uh, to look at how we can, uh, you know, replace uh, steel hatches with composite hatches and also uh, to even change the bulb. You are not removing steel, but you are adding, uh, it's almost like a nose job. You just add something on the bulb of the ship and can make it more energy efficient by adding it. Uh, so, uh, so that was the two areas we're looking into. You know, if you're looking far into the future, you could have something like self-healing materials uh, which of course is, is uh, you know bringing you new opportunities uh, if it's self-healing materials you can of course avoid having corrosion margins you can have basically lighter ships and less less weight of the ship and of course that means lower cost so it's a lot of applications here uh, on, on new materials we also see battery hybrid systems as something not only for short sea shipping, but uh, also for bulk carriers now, because the crane activities is uh, is actually a good, a good area where you can get a lot of benefits from using batteries. It's basically when you have different unbearing loads on the engines, and this is for the auxiliary engine then, then you can um, actually get a lot less fuel consumption. You can lower the fuel consumption of the auxiliary engine by pairing it with with a battery package and then you can force the engine to be operating at high loads which means less fuel consumption and at the same time have maybe even uh, you know a lower capex of the system because i think we are in the middle of the paradigm things are changing mm. and i mean if you bought a vessel 5 years ago mm. This trend that is now hadn't really started then. Mm. So it's in a way it's old now. A five year old vessel. Well, well, you have the, you know, five years ago, Ten you had these e echo ships, which I think is, you know, these ships are optimized. The hull lines are optimized for better fuel efficiency. And uh, of course, then five year and seven, eight year old ships would be, you know, really old using your expression here. Because they are not as fuel efficient as the new ones where you have basically optimized the ship for its most likely operating profile, mm -hmm. meaning speed, draught, you know, weather, different wave patterns and so on. So it's more optimized for the, the actual application. And now, of course, you will have um, uh, opportunities on, on different fuels. Of course, we see that a lot of ship owners now are are looking into what will be uh, the next fuel for shipping. You know, traditionally we have seen 
like one one fuel being used globally. I think moving forward, we will see different fuels for different applications. Hmm. I think for short sea shipping, you will see more and more full electric and battery hybrids. It could be battery with diesel or it could be battery with gas. And I think we will see the latter one, battery with gas, together with with uh, full electric. But for deep sea, it's only LNG, I think. Uh, you can also see methanol as an alternative. But uh, I think gas in general will be the, the new fuel for, for deep sea shipping. Right now, the price differential with the low price on bunker soil and, and then uh, the price differential for, for gas is not sufficient to kind of make a lot of uh, ship owners go to LNG as, as their main mm-hmm. main fuel. But of course, you also have the infrastructure challenge. and But that is actually moving quite fast now. We see there is a lot of uh, ports that are, are making moves to make LNG available for bunkering. Uh, and I think you will have a good coverage now across the world. And, of course, gas is abundant and it's uh, available, but it's not necessarily made available in the terms of uh, the quantities you, you want. If we continue on the fuel subject, mm. Mm. I mean, there will be new rules or global rules, finally, on the sulfur. Mm. Yeah. It's either 2020 or 2025. Those, those are the two dates. You know, I, I think it will be 2020. I think we will have a global sulfur requirement uh, in, by 2020. And that will, of course, also drive... LNG as a fuel, but also uh, some uh, owners are preferring uh, scrubbers. And uh, I think they both work, but I think uh, long term, I, I feel LNG is, is a more sustainable way to, to do it uh, better than scrubbers. But will there be fuel enough available? That's the big question. Yeah, I think there is, uh, there is enough gas in the world. I mean, there is uh, more gas than there is oil. So so I think uh, the gas is there, but you need to make it liquefied and you need to make it available in terms of bunkering facilities. So uh, and that is, I mean, the technology is there. It's it's about investments. And uh, I think once you have made an investment, it's, it's really not an issue. I think uh, the LNG will be made available if the bunkering infrastructure is made and built. I meet a lot of ship owners. I mean, ship owners are... In Sweden, a lot of them are family-owned, mm. small yeah. fleet of mm. five to ten ships. Mm. And they see that they have mm. to renew their fleet now because mm. it's old. Yeah. Uh, and they claim that an environmentally friendly ship is more expensive mm. than to buy the same mm. as they had. Mm. Right now it is. Actually, it's a 20% probably cost addition, CapEx point of view. So... Uh, but that's right now. And I think uh, when you start uh, using a technology, you will get cost compaction. We've seen that on batteries. We've seen it in other industries like uh, the solar PV. You know, the cost uh, has come down significantly. And we see that on batteries now. And that's why they become so interesting for ship applications. So the cost, there is a cost uh, add-on uh, right now. But I think over time, that will, will come down. And at the end of the day, uh, there might be regulations that forces you to take on board that cost anyway. But I think generally, the more applications you have of a technology, the, the, the more the cost will come down. And there is a rule of thumb that for every doubling of a technology or a deployment of a technology, the cost will come down somewhere between 10 and 50%. So when you get going, you can get the costs down significantly. It's hard to be a forerunner. Yeah, though it's tough to be the forerunner, of course. And uh, but I think uh, some ship owners are really visionary. Yeah. Uh, you have that in Sweden. You have some really visionary ship owners. Uh, I think in Scandinavia in general, you have some very visionary ship owners, and that want to do good things, and that are concerned about the environment, and they see that uh, you know moving to alternative fuels is actually contributing to a better world. And yeah. I think that's uh, good to have some companies and ship owners that are willing to do the extra. Yeah, we are in Almedalen, which is a week full of politics and things like that. Yes. And I I understand that the ship owners are trying to get the politicians to understand that we are taking a giant leap here. Mm. We are forerunners, Mm. but we need some sort of support Mm. to be the first ones to pay those 20% extra to be the good guys. Exactly, yeah. 
No, so, and there are schemes, I think, within the EU, and there could also be country-specific schemes. Uh, I know that Norway is working on, on certain schemes now that will kind of force uh, this transition into more fuel-efficient, uh, particularly for short sea shipping, where a country could really, uh, you know, make a big difference in terms of providing the right incentives. And I think you can get uh, some very quick wins in terms of better local pollution, meaning you reducing the NOx, the SOx, and, and the particulars. And then you, uh, when it comes to CO2, of course, uh, moving to gas it is uh, giving you some benefit, but it will not uh, give you a CO2 neutral or CO2 <coughs> zero emission. Uh, so you will have to uh, combine it with battery technologies, and uh, and then you can at least get some benefit for the local environment. But the CO2 and the climate uh, gases will still be a contribution when you talk about gas. As a classification society, do you have any impact on the crew, on people on board? Is that also within your... Well, we provide some training uh, and we also uh, we, we do certify simulators and, and can you know help contribute uh, in, in that. I think uh, our contribution is also to look at uh, how can the ship become smarter, giving better advice uh, to uh, the people on board. So I think that connectivity issue that we, we now see uh, that is coming with um, improved antenna technologies coming. And we also see uh, high throughput satellite systems uh, is exponentially growing right now. We think that that connectivity can actually help the crew to have a better life when they are on board. But they can also get, as I mentioned earlier, uh, more remote assistance. You can have the expert virtually on, on board the ship and, and can make better decisions based on that support. And you can also get more data so you can actually, you know, do more advanced analysis from different type of data sources, which, you know, can provide you a better insight and better knowledge so that you can take better decisions. On shore, there is a fashion on wearables. Yeah. That will probably also be not just fashionable, but maybe <clears throat> people will be wearing that on board as well. Yeah, I mean, you have a lot of devices today that can give you information. You can probably do inspection with uh, with a smartphone in, in some years. Uh, you know, you can have different ways of inspecting tanks, for instance. We, we are now piloting and actually carried out several tank surveys on board ships using drones uh, with a camera. Uh, and you can get a very good close look up of the details and uh, of course, you save time because you don't put up any staging or scaffolding. And of course, it's uh, from an HSC point of view, it's also much better. Uh, rather than having a human being in there, you have a, a drone in there. And we're also working to to actually, uh, since you don't have a GPS signal in inside uh, a ship or inside a tank, you have to do uh, the navigation with some different uh, measures and we're looking into how to do that as well. So that could be instruments and tools uh, that uh, not only the class society has available, but also the crew on board has available to do the jobs more efficient and, you know, more in a more pleasant way. It's exciting times mm. ahead, yeah. I think. I think shipping is the <clears throat> place to be. Also for the future. Yeah, no, I mean, it's the most efficient ways to, to move goods around and the world economy is really, you know, dependent on it, I would say. And uh, I think that will be the case in the future. I don't see any uh, different ways uh, that we can move goods around in as efficient way as we do in shipping. And that's the, the first good story. And the second good story is that there is a lot of things that can make shipping even more efficient. And also more convenient uh, because we, we touched on, on it earlier that digitalization could actually do the end-to-end -end kind of experience for for people that wants to to move goods around. You don't uh, have to deal so much with uh, on what is happening when a container comes at the port. You can make a more what should I say easier model transfer when you have a digital interface you don't need to worry so much so that could make shipping even more attractive when you can combine different modes of transportation into one kind of single experience hmm. yeah and also <coughs> it could be exciting for young people to look into a career within shipping i think there is a lot of opportunities here because uh, and i mean shipping is a is a traditional industry but i think now 
there is a lot of technologies I think that are really exciting. And uh, we are looking at game changers, both on fuels, uh, but also in the way ships are operated. And we talked about it. This digitalization theme is exciting for the younger generation, I think. And uh, the business models will change. And uh, I think it will be a lot of opportunities for entrepreneurs that can you know, create uh, new business models and make a difference. I think it also goes to show that we need new and other skills mm. that has been the traditional ones. True. And I think uh, shipping has been a lot about um, steel. It's a lot about welding. It's about uh, machinery. But now it's more about information and communication technology. Uh, and of course, uh, battery technologies, uh, energy systems. We are talking about both having AC and DC systems on board ships. So I think there is a lot of lot more disciplines involved now going forward than what we have seen in the past. Mm. What are the biggest changes that you have seen? You have been in shipping for a long while. Well, I, I think it's what I just mentioned now that the, the uptake of sensors and uh, now the uptake of information and communication systems because the cost of sensors is coming down. And I could easily see within four or five years that we have the computing power and the storage capability that we now have in, in a smartphone, an iPhone, in a sensor of the size of a coin. And then, of course, a lot of things would happen. So I think it's sensor technologies. I think it's antenna technology. And I think this discussion on fuels, alternative fuels, it's the biggest that has happened uh, over the last, uh, I would say, four or five years. A lot of things has, has happened in, in this space. You touched upon what you see in the future a little bit further down mm. the line. Mm. Have you got more ideas around that? No, I think there is uh, unmanned ships will come. I think that's uh, probably the most, uh, what should I say, dramatic change that we could see. You see how uh, an airplane is operated today. You have basically two people on board and some people serving the, the people on board. Uh, and you can see that also on board ships that you have not only unmanned ships, but you have reduced manning and that we have systems that support you to make better decisions. So I think that's, that's where we're going. And, uh, and I think then shipping can become more efficient in terms of cost, uh, efficient in terms of less environmental pollution, but also much more efficient in terms of better safety. So I think the safety at sea is, is not very good today. I think we lose too many seafarers on, on the oceans today. And I think these new technologies, particularly on sensor and connectivity technology, I think that can help improve the safety of sea significantly. And as a class society, that's our main purpose, is to kind of safeguard the people at sea and, and of course, also safeguarding the assets and the goods that the ships are carrying. I know that DMVGL talks and speaks about the thought leadership. Mm. Could you explain that a little bit? Well, I think we as a class society has to contribute to, to moving the shipping industry forward. And our purpose is to safeguard life, property and the environment. And in that purpose, there is a, a lot of expectations, I think. And um, to deliver on that purpose, we as a classification society has to invest a lot in, in research and innovation. So thought leadership in that context means that we should contribute with good ideas and actually contribute with new concepts and actually also try to facilitate early uptake of technologies that we believe could contribute to improve safety and reduce the environmental footprints and, and increased efficiency. So I think that's in the, the nature of the blood of classification societies and particularly the MVGL where we invest 5% every year of our turnover. That's not 5% of profit, that's 5% of turnover. It's about 1 billion Norwegian kroner, about 120 million euro every year that we very often do together with customers. And when we do it internally, we always share our findings and learnings with the industries. And I think that's what we mean by thought leadership, that we are not only you know, keeping this for ourselves, but we want to share it with the industry so that we can help move the whole industry forward. How could we become more visible as an industry? I think we need to be proud of what shipping is doing, how it's contributing. So we need to put it in a, in a world economy context, how efficient it is 
actually, compared to other ways of transporting goods around the world. And I think we need to also uh, be better at talking about these positive things that the way it's contributing today, but at the same time that it's not standing still, that it's willing to look into new ways to be more environmentally friendly, to be more efficient, and also to be more safe. So I think it's about talking and displaying the good examples and not only words, but actually showing and showcasing the, the new pilots, the fancy stuff. I think it's important for the younger generation to see that this is not something for the past. This is something for the future. So showcasing good examples and all these new pilot projects that we're working on, it's, it's really important. My personal <coughs> view is also that we shouldn't just speak to each other. We no, have a tendency yeah. to speak within mm. our own group. Yeah, and I think this is a good time of doing that because now we see that uh, at least we as a company, we are able to bring learnings from what we have in the energy space into shipping, from the energy space into oil and gas. We also, what we do within, uh, what should I say, sustainable value chains, uh, what we do within our business assurance area can also be used in in maritime and in oil and gas to create awareness. This whole digitalization discussion is also, I think, making all industries more visible to each other because now learnings can, you know, be to the benefit of others from one industry to the other. So I think we will see more cross-industrial collaborations because of that, because uh, some of the challenges are too big to be able to solve alone. So you need to tap into the expertise of of other industries and to take advantage of, of what we have in others. And we as a company are are taking a lot of initiatives in this area to kind of make sure that we take the best from more than one industry. And I think one example that we, and there are many, but one example is what we call the Green Coastal Shipping Program of Norway, where we are looking into how short sea shipping can become more efficient and reduce the environmental footprint. And gas is one of the solutions, full electric hybrid solutions are part of this. So uh, I think there is a lot of cross-industrial collaborations going on where you have you know, power providers, electricity providers, you have battery technology companies, you have um, charters, you have ship owners, you have uh, equipment suppliers working in was a consortium and uh, are piloting new things together, which you cannot do if you are only doing this within one industry. So you have to invite other industries in, which can make a difference. And you get more transparent. Yeah, and you get more transparent and you you get uh, shipping displayed in a different way than what you typically have. Yeah. Thank you for taking the time. Who would you be interested in listening to? Who do you think I should interview the next time? I think it will be interesting to uh, to look at uh, how insurers are looking into this future with uh, different fuels, uh, with different ways of operating ships. Maybe these new technologies, or I think they will, but I'm not sure how they view it, how these new technologies be- can become safer. Uh, helping to reduce uh, maybe insurance premiums and, and uh, the cost related to accidents. So it will be interesting to see how insurance companies, uh, how companies are looking at these new technologies and how we can work together to make them more efficient, uh, more safe and at reduced environmental footprint. I will try and find someone who has got uh, views on that. Thank you very much for taking the time. Uh, Thank you for inviting me. So this is the 48th episode of the Shipping Podcast. There won't be any more before Christmas, so I would like to take this opportunity to wish you all a Merry Christmas. Thank you for listening to the Shipping Podcast. It's a pleasure to be your host, and I have learned so many new things, becoming a media player, as I have established this shipping podcast. From what I understand, there is a trend now that magazines and associations is trying out podcasting as a channel for them to reach a new audience. You are all welcome. I can help you. I know all about how to set up a podcast now. I can advise you or I can help you to set it up on your own. We can work together. 
I have an audience now that you might want to reach. And I promise you, it's not only the young generation. What you as a listener can do, you can write reviews on iTunes. I know it's a little bit boring that I always bring up the subject of you writing a review on iTunes, but it helps me so much if you do. So take some time during the holidays and go into iTunes, look for the shipping podcast and write a review. Until the next time, from me to you, over and out. Thank you for listening to The Shipping Podcast. Don't forget to tell everyone that you meet that there is a shipping podcast where the maritime professionals are talking about their everyday job.